USS Alabama was a highly successful commerce raider during the American Civil War, whose history includes quite a number of, of colourful and eclectic events. So let's take a closer look. As the American Civil War progressed, the Confederacy faced a number of problems when it came to operations on the high seas. Their own shipyards were not especially capable, thanks in large part to several major yards being partially burnt by retreating Union forces. And in any case, supplies of naval equipment were hard to come by. What resources were available tended to be earmarked for the construction of ironclads and gunboats for river and coastal operations in the face of the Union blockade and seaborne offensives. However, the Union was in part supported by its continued ability to access international trade, which the blockade denied to the Confederacy. The Confederate Navy was not able to challenge the Union Navy in open combat to break the blockade after the arrival of Union ironclads to counter CSS Virginia and other similar vessels, nor could it impose a counter-blockade on the Union, even if the Union Navy somehow magically went away. So, to at least slow down the snowballing effect of trade, industry, and the resulting flow of money and equipment, the Confederate Navy needed to disrupt trade with the Union on the high seas. Apart from anything else, it was hoped that this activity would draw Union warships away to hunt the raiders, thus weakening the blockade and allowing more blockade runners to escape. But with the Confederate yards under the restrictions we've just described, and the fact that any raider built there would first have to break through the blockade, which ran the risk of capture or destruction before they actually accomplished anything, the Confederate States Navy decided to look elsewhere for solutions. At the time, the Confederacy still had a ready supply of money, thanks to its pre-war cotton trade, and so Commander James Bullock, then based in the UK, enlisted the aid of the Fraser Trenholm Company a cotton broker in Liverpool with pre-war ties to what had become the Confederate States. They went to speak to the John Laird-operated Birkenhead shipyards near Liverpool, a leading builder of all sorts of shipping. Now you might be thinking, hang on a moment, wasn't the UK neutral in the American Civil War? And, Trent Affair aside, didn't they tacitly support the Union due to the slavery issue making it politically untenable to openly support the Confederacy? Yes, that would be true. But that would also be politics. And this was business. And when it came to business, the British Empire shipyards were about as close to lawful neutral alignment as it was possibly to be. They were perfectly happy to and willing to sell weapons up to and including full warships to anybody who could come up with the cash, even if that meant selling to both sides. Because after all, there's no sense in shutting yourself out of a market. However, with the Empire was officially neutral, which made it illegal to straight-up build an armed warship for either side. However, in the manner of true capitalists, the shipyard determined a loophole. It was perfectly legal to build a ship designed to be armed, right down to having magazines, gun ports, reinforced deck mountings and the like, providing the ship wasn't physically in possession of the cannon, etc., that it was so obviously intended to have. You could then sail such a ship out into international waters, and if another ship loaded to the brim with a cargo of cannon, shot, and gunpowder, just so happened to leave port around the same time and head in a suspiciously similar direction, well, what happens at sea stays at sea, doesn't it? I mean, once it's outside of British waters, who knew what could happen? A kraken might get it. Of course, with the degree of public hostility to the Confederacy that was present in the UK, no doubt the demands by the public to do something, a very classically British complaint, uh, about a yard building a rather obvious not-a-warship for the Confederate States Navy, would rise rather quickly. And so the ship was contracted simply as hull number 290, a designation that was used in the period quite often by shipyards building ships on speculation. That is, they thought they had a good idea, or design, and would build it on the assumption that someone would come along later on to buy it. And so it would be difficult for an outsider to tell at a glance who the ship was for, based on what was easily available public information. Of course, it didn't take a world-class genius to put the threads of who was paying for what and who had connections to who, etc. together if you were taking a particularly close look at things. And so the USS Tuscaroa, 
was detailed to intercept her when she tried to leave. The Union ship, already having been frustrated in a number of attempts to seize or engage Confederate raiders that were using British Imperial ports, thanks to the various port authorities being particularly by the book in the application of port regulations as regards belligerent vessels from two sides of the same conflict. Hull number 290 would duly therefore be named Enrica and launched on the 15th of May 1862 and a couple of months later, on the 29th of July, would quietly slip out to sea with a mostly British crew recruited locally, since, after all, this was just a suspiciously built civilian vessel. Unfortunately for Tuscaroa, her bad luck would continue, as it turned out that a ship built specifically for speed as a commerce raider, travelling fresh from port with a clean hull and a much shallower draft than normal due to lacking any heavy weapons, was actually pretty quick. The SS Enrica thus made like the Roadrunner and meep meeped all the way over the horizon and out into the Atlantic, leaving Tuscaroa fruitlessly searching the Irish Sea and Western approaches. A couple of we weeks later, Captain Raphael Semmes, late of the USS Sumter, the Tuscaroa's previous target, along with a cadre of Confederate States Navy officers who just so happened to have been around, left aboard the SS Bahama, which just so happened to run into the SS Enrica off the Azores. What a fortunate meeting that was. In the mid-Atlantic, about a week after leaving port, with Sem stepping aboard on the 20th of August 1862. In a matter of sheer coincidence, the SS Agrippina also showed up and just so happened to be loaded to the brim with provisions like coal, guns, swords, powder, shot and cannon. Oh, the fates were really shining on the Enrica, weren't they? After three days of hard work by all the crews involved, the SS Enrica was rolling gently in the swell, fully outfitted for war, with a half-dozen 32-pounder smooth port cannon that would lo have looked right at home aboard one of Nelson's warships, along with a couple of much more powerful pivot-mounted weapons, a 100-pounder 7-inch rifled muzzle-loading gun, and an 18th inch smooth bore with a 68 pounder shot weight. Many, but not all, sources also seem to indicate that the ship was fitted with extra deck mountings for an additional pair of pivot guns, and some even suggest that there were a couple of extra gun ports for two additional 32 pounders as well, but not all sources agree on these particulars. A minority of sources also indicate that she would later mount a 24-pounder rifled gun taken from a prize later in her career, but I was unable to completely verify that. As with many ships of this era, there were two modes of propulsion, sail and steam, with the ship's single screw being retractable to reduce drag during sail-only operations. This was important as the 300 horsepower engine ate coal at a prodigious rate, as was very common with many early steamships, and so this was in no way a cruising power plant. As with HMS Warrior, the ship was capable of greater speed under combined power, as opposed to one or the other alone, and was capable of reaching just over 13 knots when proceeding under both sail and steam. With all this sorted out, on the 24th of August 1862, the crews of all three ships were gathered aboard the Enrica for the ship's official commissioning. The gathered men listened with varying degrees of interest as Captain Semmes stood atop a pivot gun in full dress uniform, formally read out the ship's commission to the accompaniment of rousing music, hauled down the British flag, raised the Confederate colours to the sound of a gun salute, and then exhorted the crew to sign on for a voyage aboard the now CSS Alabama. Motto, Aide toi et Dieu t'aidera, which apparently is my broken French for God helps those who help themselves. He gave them chapter and verse on the righteousness of the southern cause and offered them a voyage into the unknown, but promising that it was a voyage into destiny. This display of pomp and ceremony gathered a reaction from the crew that largely boiled down to... Nah, mate, sounds right dangerous, and I think I left my cat back home. Undaunted, Sems tried a new tactic. Bonus money for s signing on. Double the current wages, all paid in gold, plus shares in all the prize money that they could get for capturing and destroying Union ships. Likely accompanied to, uh, by shouts of, Now that's more like it! 
Sems barely managed to get the last few words of his offer out before he suddenly found himself in charge of 83 new crewmen. The remaining crew headed back to the other ships, and the Alabama still needed a couple of dozen more crew to complete its complement, but Captain Sems was sure he could find a few more volunteers aboard the ships they'd inevitably capture. The ship's course would then span a vast counterclockwise spiral, starting in the eastern Atlantic, then across to the New England coast, down to the Caribbean, over to South Africa, and then into the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific. During all this time, despite being a commissioned ship of the Confederate States Navy, she would never actually visit a Confederate port. The theatre of operations for her opening gambit was mostly around the area of her commissioning, the Azores, and many of her prizes were Union whaling ships, with the ship using both Union and British colours to approach various ships before hoisting Confederate colours and letting off a warning shot. With no real meat means of resistance, the whalers generally surrendered pretty quickly, with Alabama rapidly turning to just using a powder charge instead of actually firing a shell, since it seemed to have about the same effect. A few polite exchanges with foreign ships it came across, and some time spent stocking up on flammable provisions, primarily for setting fire to captured vessels, since at this time with low crew levels, taking ships in as prizes was not feasible. This phase of operations almost made back the ship's build cost and sent ten Union ships to the bottom. Having run out of targets in the immediate area, the Alabama would then head through several storms to the American coastline, where the pickings were more mercantile, as opposed to whaler, racking up another 13 prizes, of which ten were burnt, and three, the Emily Farnham, the Tonawanda, and the Baron de Castine, were let go after capture with prisoners aboard. Then it was off to the Caribbean to rendezvous again with the Agrippina for resupply. Unsurprisingly, operating in the seas just off the Confederate coast brought a much higher chance of interaction with the Union Navy, and she narrowly avoided battle with USS San Jacinto, a frigate with nearly twice as many guns and much heavier ones at that. The Union frigate was the same one that had actually sparked the Trent Affair earlier in the war, the resulting need for Alabama to stay on her toes, contributing to her only taking six prizes in this area, but also resulting in her fighting the first proper naval action of her career when she ran into the USS Hatteras, a paddle steamer about the same size and displacement as Alabama, but almost six knots slower and armed with only four 32-pounders and a single 20-pounder her broadside severely limited by the huge paddle wheels in a way that the screw and sail drive on Alabama was not. The action started when the Alabama strayed a bit too close to the blockade of Galveston and was spotted by the blockade fleet. Hatteras was ordered to chase the unknown ship and came up to find a vessel flying British colours, but when a boat was lowered to inspect the interloper, the Confederate colours went up along with a signal identifying the ship as CSS Alabama. At point-blank range, the raider opened up with its superior armament, and soon the Hatteras was holed and sinking. The battle was seen and heard over the horizon due to the nighttime flashing of the guns, and the sloop USS Brooklyn was sent to help. With over 20 guns, the ship would have been more than a match for the Alabama, and it was almost as fast, but it would arrive too late. Hatteras surrendered and asked for assistance, which was duly given by the Alabama's crew with Hatteras going down three-quarters of an hour after the first gun had been fired. The Alabama took aboard 118 of the 126-strong crew. Two had been killed, and the six men in the boat had made off toward the Union blockading force. Five more of Hatteras's crew had been wounded in addition to the two killed, with Alabama suffering two wounded of her own. USS Brooklyn arrived in the morning to find Alabama long gone, but was presented with the incongruous sight of Hatteras's masts sticking up out of the water, as the sea it was relatively shallow in this area. The masts still had the Union flag flying, since in the darkness no one had noticed that the ship's colours hadn't actually been struck, despite the firing of a forward signal gun to indicate surrender. After resupplying, the Alabama then headed down to operate off the coast of South America, taking a total of 29 prizes in the most successful phase of her cruise. With the crew strengthened from previous cruises and relatively few Union warships to worry about, almost half the prizes were actually captured rather than burnt, 
with the bark Conrad even being recommissioned at sea as CSS Tuscaloosa. Her new 15-strong crew enjoying a brief but relatively successful raiding career until being seized six months later by British port authorities in South Africa on a technicality. This was followed by a trip over to South Africa herself, which met with relatively little success, with only a couple of small prizes being taken and having to evade the USS Vanderbilt, a much larger paddle steamer that had been sent to find her. Not wanting to tangle with a ship three times his displacement and finding picking somewhat slim, Captain Semmes then took the Alabama across the Indian Ocean, meeting plenty of English and Dutch vessels, but very few, if any, Union ships, although she did find out that the screw sloop USS Wyoming was waiting for them near Indonesia. This was less of a concern than the Vanderbilt, as although Wyoming was slightly larger than Alabama, its long-range firepower was considerably less, relying on a pair of short-range 11-inch Dahlgrens as the primary punch. With Alabama's speed advantage, a fight between the two in open water should have relatively easily gone Alabama's way. However, in the event, neither side found the other, and Alabama had to content itself with burning three Union ships that it did find before heading into the South Pacific. In this area, Alabama would come across three more Union ships, capturing and burning all of them, with the captain kindly refusing offers of Christmas dinner from the bemused British colonists on Malacca as he landed prisoners from his latest capture. He then took a look at his ship, which had been almost constantly at sea for nearly a year and a half, and concluded that the upcoming year of 1864 was a good time to refit and repair. So far, she'd done very well, inspecting almost 450 ships, taking 65 Union vessels and over 2,000 prisoners without any loss of life on either side, with the exception of the two men killed in the duel with USS Hatteras. After nearly six more months at sea, the Alabama arrived at Cherbourg, France, on the 11th of June 1864, and asked for permission to put into dry dock. However, less than a week later, USS Kearsarge arrived. This was also a screw sloop, but it was almost 50% heavier than Alabama, a couple of knots slower when the Raider was new, but now probably about the same speed, and armed like Wyoming with a pair of 11-inch Dahlgrens as the main guns, with four 32-pounders and a 30-pound Parrot rifle backing them up. Unlike the Wyoming, however, Kearsarge had the Alabama bottled up in port, restricting its freedom of movement and range of action. Kearsarge had also summoned the smaller USS St. Louis for backup. Faced with a choice of slow death by blockade, or a chance to break out and maybe try and a run for another port, Captain Semmes issued a challenge to the Kearsarge, asking the ship to please not run away whilst he prepared the Alabama and her crew for action. News of the arrival of the Commerce Raider, the Kearsarge, and the challenge had spread, and by the time that the 19th of June dawned, a small fleet of private yachts had arrived, mostly from England, to watch like spectators at a gladiator fight, along with hundreds more lining the coast. To add to the spectacle, the French ironclad Couronne escorted the Confederate Raider out of port, not to help, but like a gigantic armoured referee, to ensure that any fighting took place outside French territorial waters. The fact that Curon outmassed both Alabama and Kearsarge combined by almost three times, and carried twice as many guns as the two ships put together, rather allowed her to enforce this condition. Kearsarge had not been idle whilst Alabama drilled for the fight, with several lengths of chain fitted over the hull to try and protect the ship's vitals from incoming fire. As the ships closed, Alabama opened fire first, with Kearsarge electing to hold its fire until the range had closed to where the massive Dahlgrens would become effective. Alabama's powder and shells had deteriorated in storage over the almost two years she'd now spent at sea, and so her crew had been drilled to fire as fast as possible to make up for the duds and the lack of accuracy that the variable burning of the powder would give any individual shot. With the heavier guns taking longer to load, aim and fire anyway, the Union ship opted for a slower and more deliberate rate of fire, trusting in the impromptu armour and the ship's greater mass to protect them until the giant ship smashers could start their work in earnest. Both ships would gradually close on each other as both captains tried to get into a raking position. The Alabama's strategy very nearly paid off as a hundred-pound shell from its big pivot gun smashed into Kearsarge's stern post, 
months earlier and the shell may well have exploded, blowing away the ship's rudder and leaving it helpless before the raking fire of the Confederate ship. However, with months of decay from sitting in the hold, the shell was a dud, and whilst the Union ship's steering was somewhat impaired, it could still manoeuvre under her captain's orders. With that opportunity missed and the range closing, the outcome was now only a matter of time, as inevitably the massive Dolgren shot would begin to find its mark, and a, a lucky 11-inch shell tore open the ship's starboard side. The Alabama began to fairly rapidly sink by the stern and struck its colours, although still being on approach to the Kearsarge with its guns run out meant that the ship was subjected to further gunfire until a hand-waved white flag was also raised. With the battle over, Kearsarge's captain accepted Alabama's request for assistance and deployed boats to rescue the surviving crew. Out of a total of the now 170 strong crew, 19 were dead and 21 wounded, including the ship's much-loved assistant surgeon, one Dr. Llewellyn, who saw the wounded off into the remaining intact lifeboats and then remained aboard the sinking vessel, going down with the ship as he had actually never learned to swim. However, Captain Semmes did not particularly want to surrender his sword, which was the traditional act of a defeated captain, instead throwing it into the sea and accepting the offer of assistance from a nearby British yacht, the Deerhound, which had come to watch. With 40 other officers and crew aboard, Deerhound raced off back to Southampton, saved from a Union broadside from the irate crew only by Captain Winslow of the Kearsarge, who doubtless, amongst other things, probably didn't want another Trent incident on his watch. Captain Semmes would eventually make his way back to the Confederacy and command the last elements of the Confederate States Navy aboard the ironclad CSS Virginia II, before leading a naval brigade almost to the end of the war and returning to a relatively successful civilian life after it. Despite her sinking, Alabama's influence was not quite done, with the arbitration case between the USA and the British Empire being labelled the Alabama Claims, as although compensation was sought for the damage caused by all British-built Confederate raiders, the Alabama was by far and away the most successful and the best known. That case, along with a number of others, was eventually settled for $15.5 million paid by the Empire, against just under $2 million paid by the USA for various actions that both sides had committed that were detrimental to the other party. Despite their individual success, the Confederate raiders did not manage to draw many Union ships off blockade duty, and indeed Alabama's escape particularly may have done more harm in the long run to the Confederate States Navy than it did good. Why so? Well, although built and allowed to sail on a technicality, the uproar in the UK as a result meant that the government was forced to take a much closer look at other ships being built for the Confederate States and ensure that they didn't pull a similar stunt. This was very much a one-time deal. This, therefore, deprived the Confederate States Navy of two small but powerful ironclad warships then under construction for them, but which were then forcibly purchased into the Royal Navy as HMS Scorpion and HMS Wyvern, ships whose armour and likely armament would have allowed them to tank almost any Union warship except those armed with 15-inch Dahlgrens and possibly the later war 11-inch versions with heavier charges. And even then, the range to penetrate the armour would have had to be exceptionally close, whilst the ships would in return be able to blow through almost any protection on Union ships and outsail any monitor with a heavy enough armament to threaten them. Of course, that wouldn't have saved the Confederacy, the simple tyranny of numbers and the fact that the Union would inevitably have built counters as a response would see to that eventually, but they certainly would have made the fight for naval supremacy off the US coast a lot more bloody, although their arrival off the Confederate coast would no doubt have been in the latter half of the war, and therefore their effect reduced by that as well. The Alabama's wreck would be discovered in 1984 by the French Navy, with a number of the ship's guns recovered over the course of the 1990s and early 2000s, along with the ship's bell, some shot, and various other artefacts, most of which are now undergoing conservation. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below.
Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.